We have a saying here at Dodgers Nation, in Friedman we trust. And today, right across from me, is the Dodgers president of baseball operations, Mr. Andrew Friedman. Andrew, one of the busiest guys on the planet right now. We appreciate you joining us today. Absolutely. Big fans of you guys. And hopefully at the end of this segment, you still say in Friedman we trust. It's time for Dodger baseball. And that's right for Dodgers have won it all in 2020. Mookie Betts, I don't care how many times this team rips my heart out, I'll never stop loving the Los Angeles Dodgers. Think blue, bleed blue, and I'm out. So, Shohei Otani, um, no, it's coming out with 103 mile per hour fastballs. Take that off the executive hat for a second, and just as a fan of the game, when you look at what he does on the diamond, basically a turducken of Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens, right? Ace level, Cy Young level pitcher, MVP level hitter. How good do you think that is for the sport of baseball that's right now trying to compete with the NFL and the NBA? Just to have the most dynamic superstar in their sport right now how important that is just for the growth of the game at the moment i think it's incredible and especially as we try to blur lines internationally and grow this game uh you know from a worldwide perspective and uh what he has done these last three years is historic um and obviously that's great for the game and you look at marketing dollars and opportunities in baseball compared to other sports and how far we lag behind that. Um, you know, Shohei has a chance to kind of bust through that ceiling and create a lot of opportunity for other players behind him. And as he does that will only help baseball just continue to grow in popularity. You look at the way this roster has been constructed. You've got the big signs and Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman. Last year, as you mentioned, weren't too aggressive. A lot of one-year deals. J.D. Martinez, Noah Syndergaard, David Peralta, Jason Hayward comes in on a minor league deal. When you look at just how effective they were for you in helping build that winning team, you head over to this season, you got to address starting pitching. You got a massive free agent out there. Is there anything as far as where the payroll is set up right now that prevent you to make one of the biggest signings ever or limit you in any capacity during this free agency? No, we're in a good spot uh, financially. And I think even beyond that, our ownership at every single turn has said, do what helps us win and have been incredibly supportive. And I'm not just saying that, like literally every step along the way and it was a risk factor when i made the decision to come to the dodgers that was a risk factor for me was thinking through the dynamic with ownership and how would that play out um and it's been incredible and they've backed it up at every turn and you know there have been some things we've tried to do that haven't lined up on and obviously other things we have done that everyone knows about but at every turn, the support from ownership has been incredible. So I don't expect this off season, future off seasons to be any different. When you see the rumors out there, the reports that all the insiders say, oh, the Dodgers, they're the favorites to sign Shohei Otani. When you see that and you follow that, you're like, well, that's news to me. Where's this coming from? Do you react to it at all? Just what's your reaction just to kind of have that expectation out there that you guys are the favorites to line the most coveted free agent in professional sports history, really? Yeah, obviously it's hard for me to talk about a free agent right yeah. now, but I I do think it's a lazy narrative. Oh, it's right up the freeway. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, Southern California. Look, I, I think, forgetting just Shohei, I think if a player who is a free agent really cares about winning, I think you can look back and then look ahead and I would argue we're the best positioned of any team. Now, I'm sure other teams would argue differently, and I totally get that and respect it. But I think what we have demonstrated, where our core players are today, the strength of our farm system, our financial flexibility, I think you could look out for the next five to seven and make a very compelling argument. And so I think that resonates with free agent players, at least I hope it does. Um, and it's something that 
you know, I think is meaningful in a lot of guys' decision as they're going through this. Yeah, and you always have to see it as the ultimate compliment, right? You guys, 11 straight postseason bursts, won the division 10 out of the last 11 years. You were as ultra competitive as any organization out there. Previous ownership groups I've seen just growing up here, it hasn't always been the case where you're in the mix for every single free agent as far as people thinking that you have a chance to sign. You have to almost see that as we have proven to the baseball world where if you want to add the chance to win as fickle as the postseason can be, if you go to the Dodgers, you are going to get a ticket to the dance and be in the postseason. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something we never take for granted. Um, I think it's important for us to uh, to not. It's hard to get in. Obviously, it's easier now, last year and this year, with the expanded playoffs. But it's not easy to get there. It's never going to be something that we're flipping about, which I think helps us maintain our edge. And look, even just having the success that we've had over the last 9, 10, 11 years, regardless of how exactly you define that, and different people have different opinions on that, which I get, I think we are incredibly well positioned for the next 5 to 10. And, you know, we're going to do everything we can to bring a championship to L.A. and have the parade. And the I can't imagine how special that will be with the passion that our fans have for this team to be able to celebrate it in that way is something that really, really motivates us. Yeah. And I've heard you say in the past that along the journey, you had to have moments of joy, right? And that you don't want to have just one great season. You want to have that sustainability and give yourself a chance to win every single year. But at some point, is it ever tempting to possibly risk some of that sustainability because you have a group of guys that you say, okay, you add this piece here, maybe that puts us over the top, or you just look at baseball in general. It's so fluky in the postseason. The best team doesn't always win that the risk of doing that is not worth risking the sustainability of it. I think the answer is both because we have made offers and tried to do things yeah, yeah. that in retrospect, I'm really glad didn't line up. Um, but it's also not the right sport because going quote unquote all in doesn't guarantee you anything. If it did, it's a way easier calculus, but the fact that it doesn't, you have to be real about what that actually does for your odds and, you know, how to balance that. But we've taken shots at things that probably don't make sense and I'm glad they didn't line up. Um, and we've done some things that, you know, according to, you know, our deal math on something yeah. that doesn't make sense, but we're shifting more of the value and the focus to that current year. I mean, almost every buy side trade at the trade deadline is underwater. It doesn't yeah. make sense. Um, and so almost every one of those, you have to suspend some of that. Um, but it's the balance because yes, we are trying to su sustain success over the long term, but we're also in each given year trying to win a championship. And it's that art of that back and forth that, you know, is the most consuming aspect, I think, of our job. Yeah, and as far as your approach to signing free agents, I think there's this myth out there. I saw a report the other day, oh, Shohei might want a shorter term deal. People are saying, oh, Andrew Freeman, the Dodgers, they're gonna be excited about that. For me, I would say, okay, they signed Mookie, 365 million. Freddie at 32, $162 million. For you, the approach, is it more case by case, player by player, versus just hard and fast rules as far as, oh, we're not gonna go big on this guy, go that guy, or is it just every single player has their own benefits to the consideration of getting them signed? Yeah, I, I don't think we have any hard and fast yeah. rules about anything, but I think when you are investing the sums of money that we're talking about with the big free agents, there are a lot of things that we want to know about a player. Um, and it's why it's easier to be more aggressive with players that have been in your clubhouse that you get to see on a daily basis. You have a sense for how they work, um, how they recover, what kind of teammate they are. Um, and so for from our standpoint, we do as much digging as we possibly can. And there are times where that digging is spot on when we get a guy. And there's other times where it's not. And it's not that we got bad information. It's that when you put a guy in your clubhouse, in your environment, it could just play out differently. And so for us to invest that amount of money 
and how important it is for guys to be ultra competitors. And where that plays out is their work ethic. What they did in their 20s to achieve the success they had, they're going to need to do things differently in their 30s to sustain it. And so how they're wired, whether they're playing for the money or whether they're playing to get into the Hall of Fame or to achieve you know, the ultimate team success, it's a hard thing to get at, especially with a player on another team. You know, Freddie, obviously, we felt really confident with the information we had. Um, and there are other guys that we've made big offers on that haven't lined up. But it's just harder for us if a guy is with another team that we don't have that same level of information. And as far as the process goes, first of all, I mean, lots of big free agents through the years. You seem to pick the ones that are the best. I mean, last MVP, you had two of the top three, first time for the Dodgers since 1974. You're really getting peak Freddie Freeman as far as offensive production right now. Let's say you're building your ultimate free agent, what you look for. I know it's very nuanced, something intangibles. What are you looking for aside from the production as far as age, peak performance, intangibles, kind of reputation around the league? Just how does that process work when you're saying, okay, we're going to give out 100, 200, 300, 400 plus million dollars to a potential player? I mean, obviously the on-field production is important. You can set that aside. I think getting a feel for who they are as a person, what motivates them, you know, I'll say that Mookie and Freddie, beyond the value they provide on the field, the trickle-down effect of Mookie's willingness to go play the infield and in the seventh inning go kick out to the outfield – when we're working with one of our minor league guys and talking about the value of being at, like the positional versatility, what Mookie does makes that a very easy conversation. When we talk about the importance of preparing your body for the rigors of a season and keeping yourself strong going into October and all that that entails, you can point to Freddie, you can point to Mookie, and it makes it so much easier for us on a development front. And so the trickle down effect from that, the impact that these guys have on your organizational culture is significant. So who they are as people, how they're wired, what motivates them are really important aspects. Yeah, when you look at your history too, Tampa Bay, the Zobris deal, the Longoria deal, some of the best value deals of the sport's ever seen. How important is it and how tempting is it when you know all the resources you have, the financial muscle, the prospect capital, to be judicious with these types of contracts moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, each market has its own kind of unique challenges and, um, you know, with the Rays, it was, we didn't have the financial wherewithal of the teams we were competing against. And so we had to take some chances on guys where, you know, the Yankees and Red Sox could sit back and, and wait. And, you know, I wondered at the time when I was with the Rays, why they weren't a little bit more aggressive on signing some young players. And, you know, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. And when it doesn't, it's just not as significant for them as it would be for the Rays, just like it's not as significant for the Dodgers. Um, but I think there's a mindset that comes with a player that are more willing to do it when you're with the Rays and they understand the bigger picture and that there's not necessarily a much bigger pot at the end of the rainbow with the Rays. Um, although obviously they've signed some big deals as well. Um, but there's not necessarily that same potential as there is with the Dodgers or the Red Sox or the Yankees that I think psychologically affects players some and their willingness or desire to do something early. And for us, the zero to six years of control effectively are one-year options. So having max flexibility for us has value. And yeah. so, you know, obviously we've tried to do some with some younger guys. It just hasn't lined up. Um, but where we are, how clean kind of our future commitments are, especially as compared to some other teams, just presents opportunity. 
And it's not to say that we're opposed to having more obligations, you know, on our books out in the future. We're just picky about who we do it with and um, appreciating the risk and downside and the limiting of flexibility that comes with that, which has real value. Yeah, and as far as the pitching goes, uh, I think it's funny, this whole narrative, okay, they don't value starting pitching. I saw that after the postseason, right? You look back at your time here, the Dodgers, number one ERA, number one expected fit, number one fit. You go across the board, you're at the top, pretty much every single pitching category. This past season, combination of injuries, some off the field stuff, you led to a somewhat compromised, I'm assuming not 100% Clayton Kershaw there in game one, inexperienced Bobby Miller in game two, Lance Lynn struggling in game three. This offseason, though, when you look at addressing that starting pitching, you got Walker Buehler coming back, Bobby Miller continuing to merge some of these other younger pitchers. Is it something where you're looking for one frontline guy, two frontline guys? How would you look at trying to rebuild this rotation this season? Um, to me, I think it's just being opportunistic, meaning that if something lines up where we get two really good starters who, um, you know, we feel really confident can start a playoff game, that's great. They're hard to get. The supply demand of starting pitching this winter is not necessarily in our favor. It never is um, because there's a scarcity of good starting pitching. And so it makes it harder just based on how much demand there is. Um, but we're not going to shut off the chance of trying to line up on, on multiple things. But at the, end, at the end of the day, when we show up in February uh, at CBR, it's feeling confident that our starting rotation will be a real strength for us. Right or wrong, pitching and defense uh, has been a huge part of the success that we've had over the last 9, 10, 11 years. And it's just a better quality of life. Like I personally yeah, I mean, enjoy it way more. Give me six or seven, get to the bullpen. Yep. It's closing it's out. Very consistent with, you know, the lineage of the Dodgers and so much of the organizational success. Uh, when you think back over time to Koufax, Drysdale, Hershiser, Fernando, and obviously Kershaw. Um, and so for us, ideally, we have five really good starting pitchers. You know, that doesn't always line up that way. But as you mentioned, you look back over the last five, six, seven, eight years, starting pitching has been a strength of ours. And, you know, we went into the playoffs in 21 with Scherzer, Bueller, um, Julio, you know, this year just played out differently than what we expected in March. And that's on us. Um, and it's about doing everything we can to put ourselves in a position to not have that happen again. We we'll probably need a little bit of luck or not bad luck, but we're going to do everything we can to when we hopefully put ourselves in a position to qualify for October and then feel really good about our chances because of the strengths of our roster. Yeah. And if you look at this free agency class, you got Nola, you got a lot of great names, Montgomery, you got Snell. You also got two Japanese pitchers. They're going to be made available to sign you guys. Deep history from Hideo Nomo, Hiroki Kuroda, so many great Japanese pitchers. Kent Maeda to the deal. You sign great contract, a lot of great incentives there. When is it going to be time to really step back into that Japanese market? And how much of a priority is that? Yeah. I mean, I think um, there are some really talented pitchers over there, two that are coming out, but way more that are over there that over time will. Um, I went over there twice this year, um, and it's incredible how well they are developing starting pitching over there. And I'm sure there are things that we can learn um, from what they're doing. But, yeah, I mean, obviously we have a rich history um, and tradition with Japanese pitchers and certainly has a lot of appeal and value to us, not just this off season, just going forward. Yeah. And then you got some of the internal options. You got Walker Bueller coming back second arm surgery. He was trying to make it back there too much. It was kind of wild, but he's the ultimate competitor. Wouldn't expect anything less from Walker Bueller. What are your expectations though? As far as, is there going to be a limit to his innings? He's going to get back to me that a status pitcher. I mean, what are your expectations for Walker Bueller as he returns? I certainly wouldn't bet against him. Um, he is the ultra, uh, the ultimate competitor. And, you know, we're going to continue to kind of assess things 
this off season and as we get into spring training, I don't think it's realistic to expect him to go from opening day through hopefully a really long October. Um, if you ask him, he'd be like, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Uh, so we'll have to think about the right way to try to balance that and handle that. He is coming off second surgery, but watching how he attacked his rehab process last year, the position he got himself into last September, it was really good. And we just didn't want to push it at that point and just a little slower to recover, which makes sense that close to surgery, but it made us even more optimistic of what things would look like in 2024. And then Bobby Miller, another great rookie, had a big impact. Coming into the season, he had a strikeout rate under 20% at the minor league level. Did he exceed your expectations? No, I mean, he was a guy that we were more confused by his minor league yeah. performance than thinking that was indicative of who he was or his talent. There was some, you know, pitch selection. You know, for us, we're not trying to get guys to perform in the minor leagues. Usually it falls out of you know, a good process, but, you know, a lot of things with Bobby is, hey, we're trying to develop the two-seamer. We're trying to get him to, you know, really land his curveball. So you're not necessarily optimizing usage of how you would attack a righty or a lefty or what you would do with two strikes that can eat into performance sometimes. So we thought very highly of him and not just the ability, but also the makeup. Yeah, and you look at the stuff he has just off the charts. If you were going to go into a lab and build a starting ace pitcher, he'd be the guy. Six, four, five pitch mix, throws gas. Do you think that he is someone that projects to be a pillar for this rotation, an ace for you guys for years to come? Yeah, I do. I think uh, not just the arm talent, but the body, the way the mind works. Um, you know, he obviously didn't have his best outing in game two. But there are some guys who kind of shy away from that moment and others who puff out their chest at that moment. And there's no question in my mind, I wish we had gotten back to a game five because I would have bet a lot on Bobby going out and pitching really well. He just didn't have feel for his off speed uh, early, which happens. And I would have bet a lot that he would have pitched really well in game five. And even then, that experience is invaluable, right? Just the ability to have a young guy, get a taste of it, feel him all off season. He's going to be big moving forward. Now, rest of this rotation, you got Pepio, you got Sheen, you got Grove. What did impress you most by these young pitchers last year for the Dodgers? You know, I think you look at minor league players coming up to the major leagues and not that often is it a perfect linear straight line. Oftentimes there's challenges and, you know, Pepio is a great example in 22. Yeah. Um, wasn't nearly as good as kind of we thought and uh, the expectations, but when we got to the end of that season and I've seen it with a lot of really talented young pitchers in the past, but we would have bet a lot that he was going to take that experience, do everything he could in the off season to put himself in the best position for 2023 and he did that and he pitched incredibly well um and so i think sheehan is someone very similar where he had some really good stretches he had some stretches where he wasn't as good but the overall level of talent in our mind hasn't changed at all and if anything gaining that experience is incredibly valuable for 24 and beyond um and obviously grover is a great competitor and you know had some big splits where he was you know kind of dominating righties and struggling some versus left but i think you know once he started once he developed the cutter and started using that in the curveball i think pulled that back some so he's a really talented pitcher who uh love his makeup as well and think he's going to really help us this year and what role and how that's going to play out. We're not sure yet. As far as the trade deadline last year, you guys are very active. Of course, we had with Eduardo Rodriguez, first person in history of the universe to choose Detroit over Los Angeles, right? We know what happened there, but as far as using the trade market this off season to address starting pitching, do you anticipate being aggressive there? Yeah. I mean, I think there's going to be a number of really interesting starters on the trade market and there obviously are on the free agent market. 
And so we're kind of going down simultaneous paths right now of conversations on the trade front, you know, the free agent calls and Zoom calls and making sure that guys have a feel for our group and the dynamic of our group. You know, we'll do a call with a guy and walk through with, Mark Pryor and Connor McGinnis, our two pitching coaches, with Danny Lehman, who is really involved from a game planning standpoint, and how connected that information is from our pitching guys to our bullpen coach, to our game planning and bench coach, Danny Lehman, and how that gets to our catchers, how what they're trying to accomplish with their delivery makes it into what they're doing in the weight room, in the training room, and trying to you know, show that off and show off our people who are incredibly talented. And so that process is going on now, coupled with trade conversations to get a feel for what's most real. Yeah. When you look at the shortstop position, got Gavin Lux coming back. Just kind of talk about the future of that position and how much confidence you have in him. Yeah, it, uh, that kind of kickstarted some of the unfortunate events of, of 2023 when he got hurt in that spring training game against the Padres. Uh, we were really excited for him to get that opportunity. Uh, in 2021, when Seeger got hurt, um, Lux took over and played really well at short. He's incredibly rangy. And at second, taking him to a new position, you know, sometimes the feel part of the throws is hard because you're used to ripping from yeah. the shortstop spot. And, you know, we just have a lot of comp. He grew up a shortstop. Um, and now we have to layer on this knee injury and how that's going to affect things. I think seeing how he went about his process, um, you know, gives us a lot of confidence. But this is not rehabbing, you know, Daniel Hudson's yeah, yeah. knee injury. This is a dynamic, really twitchy athlete of making sure we get that back. Uh, no offense to Daniel Hudson and <laughs> yeah. his athleticism and twitchiness, um, but we feel really good about where he's at right now. Yeah, and if you look at that position, kind of during the postseason, there was this narrative that the Dodgers let Corey Seager walk. Now, I just want to get your opinion on just the free agency process, how it's free agents, right? They have the ultimate decision, but what's your reaction just kind of that narrative? Yeah, I mean... He's incredibly talented Yeah, and came up through our system and went and signed with the Rangers. So I get the sentiment about it. You know, it's hard to get into it too much, but, yeah. um, you know, there are players that, uh, you know, have engaged earlier, have shown a real desire to be here that we've, been aggressive and lined up and figured things out. You know, I think it was important for him to go out and test free agency, which I respect. You know, when guys get to that point, it's a significant accomplishment to have enough service to get to that point. And then once you get to that point and you're as talented, there are going to be a lot of different opportunities that come with that. And for us, you know, we felt like we were aggressive and tried to make it happen. Didn't necessarily have the back and forth to try to get something done. But then we ended up with Freddie Freeman and are distributing our talent in a little different way. So, I mean, yeah, Corey Seager is incredibly talented. Um, you know, we're all big fans of his, of who he is as a person, him, Maddie. Um, but that's the way it played out. And unfortunately, things like that are going to play out in the future. And ideally we're well positioned to absorb when that happens. Obviously we want to limit it as much as we can, but I'm sure things like that will happen in the future as well. Yeah. And if you look at the success of all the talent that's come out of your farm system, how proud are you of that? The fact that the system is designed for you guys to pick towards the end of the draft, right? Take away international bonus pool signing money. The fact that you guys are still able to scout and develop and be able to churn out all this high level talent, just even though you're competing for world series titles of all the things you've accomplished with the Dodgers, how proud are you of this farm system and what's the secret to their success? Yeah, I'm incredibly proud of it. Like you said, everything is designed for us to have a bottom three, five farm system. 
uh, beyond where we pick and our international bonus money being less, we're competitive every year, which means we're not trading off shorter term assets like players with one year of control for future value. We're just never in real position to do that because we're always trying to win. And you look at other large revenue teams who have had a dip. And during that dip, they traded off some players with limited control left and were able to add some young players to the mix. We really haven't been able to do that. And I think it goes without saying, but a huge part of the success that we've had is the work of our scouting group, both international and pro, um, as well as the amateur, just our entire scouting group and our player development group. And I think it's a cliche to say, oh, scouting and player development, it's really important. I think how locked in and unified everyone is, is the secret to our success. And we've lost a lot of employees over the last five, seven, eight years. We average 40 plus permission requests an off season. And everyone's like, oh, we're going to hire this guy from the Dodgers and he's going to come here and replicate it. But it's not just about one person. And it's the way the entire group works together and how they complement one another. And the success that we've had in that part of what makes it so gratifying is how many fingerprints are on it. This is not about one master scout or one yeah, master yeah, yeah. player development guy. It's an entire department and scouting departments that work together and aren't afraid to argue and disagree, but are unified in what we're trying to accomplish. Now you can feel how interconnected, how everyone's in lockstep, and then you just see it bear for a year in and year out. Now, as far as the role of the farm system and the challenge of having all these great players blocking prospects at multiple positions and the fact that you could be engaged in trades, is it about building prospects for trades, building prospects to be contributors, just trying to get as many quality players as you can and just use them as assets? Um, I, I mean, I think it's great. Um, for us to draft or sign players who come up through our system, come to LA and are big contributors for a long time. Sometimes that opportunity isn't there for them, whether it's an existing player that we have signed long term. Um, and obviously, we've been really aggressive on the trade market over the last five, seven, eight years. I would argue no one has traded more young players than we have. Um, and so in an ideal world, when we're drafting a guy, it's never, oh yeah, we'll look to trade him in two or three years, just like James Outman emerging this year, ideally. And I would bet on Vargi, uh, Miguel Vargas to emerge this year after the experience he had last year. Ideally, we can continue graduating really talented players to our major league team and have them be a big part of what we accomplish in the future. Sometimes that's going to work out and sometimes trades are going to line up that are too compelling, but it's never our thought process of, Oh, we're going to look to trade this guy. Kind of just shifting gears a little bit, talking about last season. And of course you look at the last year, I think it almost feels like you kind of moved the goalpost on the season. You head into the year, not many people picking the Dodgers to win the NOS. You finished with the most days spent on the IL. You essentially lose your entire opening day rotation. You still found a way to win 100 games. What do you think are the biggest success stories from last season as far as, yeah, nine rookies make their debut, 17 rookies contributed. We look back at last year, we know the standard here, win the World Series, but what were those success that you point at moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I think going into last year, we didn't share the public sentiment yeah. that we were you know, taking our foot off the pedal. Obviously, we weren't as aggressive in free agency, but we've had other years like that too. Um, you know, it's easy for people to focus on what's right in front of them, but we haven't been able – We no team can make big moves every single offseason. Um, and so – Obviously, we're tasked with being as good as we can be in that current year while maintaining and having sustainability out in the future. 
and you can't be aggressive in free agency every year and have any chance of doing that, of sustaining success. And, you know, we've seen it with a lot of big, large revenue teams in the past who have a run of success and then fall off the cliff. And so for us, it made sense with where our upper level uh, guys in our system were to afford that opportunity. And, you know, we thought we had a really good chance to win the division going into the year. Obviously, we got there in slightly different ways. You know, Mookie and Freddie having historic seasons. Um, you know, the pitching injuries and things to our rotation were beyond, even when we're being conservative and trying to project out, was beyond what we could have fathomed. Um, but a number of those young guys coming up, probably more than what we expected last year. But that bodes well for the future. The experience they got, the information we were able to gain from that uh, is really valuable and will help us in 24 and beyond. Yeah, and you always have to see it as the ultimate compliment, right? You guys, 11 straight postseason bursts, won the division 10 out of the last 11 years. You're as ultra competitive as any organization out there. Previous ownership groups I've seen just growing up here, it hasn't always been the case where you're in the mix for every single free agent as far as people thinking that you have a chance to sign. You have to almost see that as we have proven to the baseball world where if you want as a chance to win, as fickle as the postseason can be, if you go to the Dodgers, you are going to get a ticket to the dance and be in the postseason. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something we never take for granted. Um, I think it's important for us to uh, to not. It's hard to get in. Obviously, it's easier now, last year and this year, with the expanded playoffs. But it's not easy to get there. It's never going to be something that we're flipping about, which I think helps us maintain our edge. And look, even just having the success that we've had over the last – 9, 10, 11 years, regardless of how exactly you define that, and different people have different opinions on that, which I get, I think we are incredibly well positioned for the next 5 to 10, and you know we're going to do everything we can to bring a championship to L.A. and have the parade, and the, I can't imagine how special that will be with the passion that our fans have for this team to be able to celebrate it in that way is something that really, really motivates us. You look at recently, you said the 2022 team was the most talented team you've ever put together. When spring training starts, you think that 2024 Dodgers team has a chance to be the most talented team you've ever put together? I don't know. I'm not ever going to use that 2022 yeah. team as a barometer. Um, I just don't think it's realistic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I think we're going to be incredibly talented. I feel really good about the base of talent we have in place right now and then the opportunities that we have this winter to add to that, I feel really confident that we're going to get to spring training and feel really good about our championship odds. Awesome. So you're going to announce some pictures here. You guys got those queued up? Oh, boy. My friends from Tulane sent me these. Well, there's a little league picture. All right. Look there we go. Probably, probably made the all-star team on that one, right? <laughs> I got the next one. There we go. Got Andrew Freeman right there, bottom left. A mean mug in it there. Tell you the next one we got. Uh, there we go. There we go. I need that Andrew Freeman throwback. That's my holy grail throwback. It's a the nice two lane turtle. The mock turtle up there when those yeah. were big. Yeah. Next one we got. Oh, I don't know how that got. Who put that up there? <laughs> how, I don't know how that got there. Okay. The next slide. And so I wanted to ask you, what's going on in this picture? This is iconic. This is iconic. Like I said, when you see the bobblehead, do you always wear a robe when you're listening to Lady Gaga, or what's the deal here? Winter meetings. Um, I can't remember the year. Maybe 20... Whenever it was in Vegas, they all kind of blend together for me. There's a weird dynamic that comes with the winter meetings. It's great for the game. People are talking even more about baseball during those days, which is great. But it sets up a weird dynamic where... We meet with the media at 5 o'clock every day. Those days are really no different than today, which I'm not just randomly meeting with the media at 5 o'clock to give an update on my day. And because we don't really want to say, hey, we met with this player, we made this offer, we think we're getting close, or hey, we met with this team, we're trying to <laughs> yeah. trade for this player, it sets up a bunch of nothing. It's hard to say anything um, unless you have a deal to announce. 
And even if you have agreed to terms of the free agent, until the physical's done, we can't talk about it either. So it just sets up for a weird dynamic. And the Monday, I think this was a Tuesday, on Monday, the first day of the winter meetings, kind of going back and forth with our beat guys. And I get that they have a job to do and they need to write. It's just hard for me to know what to give them yeah, yeah, to help exactly. them in yeah, that yeah. because <laughs> I don't want to tip our hand of what we're doing. So I didn't have a lot to say. And they're like, I don't understand. What'd you do all day? I was like, yeah, spa day, nothing. <laughs> a little spa day. So the next day when they showed up, I put the robe on and said, hey, just to get this out of the way, spa day today, no meetings with teams or agents. You know, so unfortunately, that's all I got. There you go. Send that robe to Cooperstown. I'm telling you, when you get your statue at Dodger Stadium, you're going to be right next to Jackie. Koufax Kerr is going to be in that robe. But Mr. Andrew Freeman, we cannot. My mom texted me and she was like, I don't understand. <laughs> why are you wearing a robe? And did you go to a Lady Gaga concert? <laughs> it's like, I don't know why that magazine's there, but no. That is the ultimate. But hey, we cannot thank you enough. We know you're the busiest man on the planet right now. Thank you so much for your insight on running the Los Angeles Dodgers, president of baseball operations, Mr. Andrew Freeman. Thank you so much for joining us here at Dodgers Nation. Huge fan of what you guys do. Thanks a lot for having me on. 